You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Monday. It might, means it is time for Mental Health Monday. Uh, I'm just running all my words together today. It's, but It's uh, it's fall. Yes. It's October. It's cold. It's flannel weather. Oh, boy, is it cold. It's totally flannel weather. It's, it's fantastic, uh, actually. Literally frost out there this it morning. It froze last so, night at, yeah. at my house. Mm -hmm. Chilly morning. And it's a good morning for our conversation on mental health with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin. Thanks for your support of the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is time to check in with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman for Mental Health Monday. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning. Happy Monday and welcome to Mental Health Monday. A good topic on deck today. Yeah, I'm excited. We're going to uh, move on from what we were talking about, about shame and autonomy and build another layer on that, on our developmental theories. And this one is initiative versus guilt. And so we're going to focus in today on what is initiative and really defining that well. And then in the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about specifically how initiative impacts our mental health. Uh, and then we'll move on to building that initiative and also the roadblocks to it as we move forward. And so today, defining initiative. Initiative is this ability that God gives us to assess a situation, to assess life around us and our interactions, and to initiate some things independently, uh, initiate things independently. And so I was kind of curious off the top, and this this wasn't on our notes, sorry guys, but <laughs> how do you feel about initiating, I guess? Let's, let's I don't know, ask a, a free-flowing question there. How do you feel about initiating? initiating things. How about you, Sarah? Oh, man, you are digging in deep this morning. Um, <laughs> Already, right? You're welcome to Monday. As a youngest child and as an introvert, initiative probably is a quality I need to work on. You can probably ask my husband. Uh, <laughs> um, I have learned much better being in the working world since I uh, started jobs and I had resp more responsibility how to have initiative better and to work at it and to be forward thinking enough to understand where that would actually need to happen and to be confident enough that I can actually do what I think I want to start doing. Mm -hmm. well, you hit on a lot of good stuff there. That's really good. How about you, Andy? <laughs> um, projects, yes. Ideas and things like that. Creativity, uh, taking the initiative and, and leading a project, yes. Social settings, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's like, good. You yeah. just identified, yeah, 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 yeah. You both identified some stuff there, like moving within a family as well as moving within our circle of friends or a congregational setting or our communities and neighborhoods and things like that, versus, you know, the areas where we are given to carry out more like task oriented vocation, if you will. That's That's a good distinction. That's good. I'm impressed, you guys. Good job. <laughs> you get a Heidi like gold mental health star, even though those don't exist yes. because like oh, they should exist. Are, like the best thing, oh, right, man. for mental health. Instead, I function on gold stars these days. <laughs> okay, good. I thought maybe like a badge. Like I did. This is what the badge would say. I did the hard mental health work this morning, right? It wouldn't yes. be like I did it right or wrong. It'd just be I did the work this morning for my mental health. So that's good. Um, the other piece of initiative is identifying opportunities opportunity, which you both kind of uh, insightfully spoke into what you just said. And this really has to do with at the core for mental health stuff is utilizing what we call agency, which is our sense that we have a choice, that we have power in a situation instead of um, where we feel real helpless and we don't have a voice. And so we'll get into that. You'll see, I know this, I just feel like it's such a tender topic for our place and our role as the church on earth to, to be a voice for the voiceless, as well as to have our own voice, but to also balance that with humility and things like that. And so theologically, the concept of initiative 
is just a really cool gift from God that does a lot of powerful things in our lives. And also just like anything else can uh, use a little toning, if you will, <laughs> just like mm -hmm. our muscle work needs some toning. I think our initiative needs some toning to both like rise up and also to step back at times. And so we would see that a little bit different, I think, uh, than the secular world, like understanding that place of humility in it. But even then, I think in social science and psychology, we understand the role of like kindness, basic kindness now, um, and the impact that that has on our mental health when we interact with each other. So initiative at its core is also leadership. You know, anytime you're talking about the concept of leadership, which is a really popular topic, right? There's lots of podcasts <laughs> out about that and all kinds of things in the business setting. But what about like leadership within family settings or leadership within uh, a, a faith-based community? or leadership even in the classroom with students and things like that. Um, we want leaders, right? We want to grow little leaders is what you'll find in the article that comes out of my blog, HeidiGaiman.com tomorrow, um, is about growing these little leaders. How do we do that? Because this is a developmental phase that's very early on, you know, and it's before a lot of the social constructs that we have of building friendships um, and finding legacy. And so this is really important really early on. Um, so initiative, we start getting to leadership by looking at closer at what initiative is. And so initiative has that curiosity that we talked about last month a lot, right? That ability, autonomy uh, that I can go explore and I can see uh, new things. And there's some safety because there's boundaries in that, but I can still have some freedom in that and free will. And my free will isn't shame filled. It isn't a terrible thing that I have choices to make. Instead, I know I'm capable of making uh, good choices because God is working in me and even more so as a believer in Christ Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit residing in me that's going to help me with that. And so that's something we teach to our kids, but we also, I don't know about you guys, need a daily reminder of, <laughs> like, hey, you know, you can explore in freedom. Don't be ashamed that you have ideas. Don't be ashamed that you have a voice to share because while you'll mess up, there's always forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And I think that changes the shape for us as Christians of how we step forward in leadership uh, without that, that shame that really impacts uh, an agency culture, that really impacts a church culture and a working environment as well as our families. So it also now uh, initiative brings in then with it, not just, oh, freedom of exploration, but now we're talking problem solving skills. So I can explore, but when I run into a problem or a frustration or an idea that isn't panning out for me, what am I going to do about it? And so initiative is that phase where we learn that we're capable of working it out for ourselves. And I know Andy and I have referenced love and logic to death during these mental health Mondays. And so <laughs> I feel like we have to do it again, though, you know, like the ability to have a small child. So we're talking under the age of six here. Uh, believe that they can solve a problem for themselves. Can you just envision in your head how empowering that is for them? Uh, then put the Jesus lens on it, right? So believe that they can solve a problem for themselves. And if their problem, if they don't solve it correctly, or if they make a mistake, what happens? there's forgiveness, there's grace, there's still learning. And so I just think this communicates the gospel to children so clearly. And um, we want to put a name to that. You know, we want to say that Jesus is where it comes from and we need some verbalization for that. But when we also just allow the space in our homes and our classrooms and our Sunday schools and all those places for kids to believe that they can solve the problem themselves and ask them questions like, uh, what ideas do you have? How do you think that works? How would you deal with this? Then watching them work through the process, being a stable, safe person and place that they can come to when they're struggling to figure out the answer um, and when they don't get the quote unquote right answer, being cautious of how often we expect a perfect right answer and call that success. Those are ways we grow little leaders in our culture. Um, and so we're basically getting kids to ask, where can I contribute? Where can I lead? And you can see that the opposite of this is guilt, where we 
we don't feel like we can contribute or we don't have something to say. And unfortunately, our world is cold, I think, toward children. Like we see them as lesser versions of people. Uh, this is one reason why abortion is rampant, right? Um, and in a culture where abortion is rampant, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we feel about three-year-olds? You know, how do we feel about 12-year-olds? Are they half citizens? Um, I think this is a real issue as we lean into uh, building up those future leaders for our culture is if we can take off layers of guilt and they feel like they can contribute uh, fully because they have heard the message of Jesus Christ and that is what is empowering them because it's different from the coldness the world gives to children. Whoa. You know, I, like for me, I feel like that's world shaking. Um, and we can, that's where we're going to see some change also in our societies and our cultures. So my question for you is what ways have you seen children learn leadership skills? You know, what kind of leadership skills have you seen in practice in, in children in classrooms or in families in different situations? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. So I, I have three examples. Um, my, wow, my, she did my, her homework. I was thinking I about love it. <laughs> It's bad day um, for Sarah. Let's just say it yes, out loud, right? No. I need those right now, man. <laughs> Moving is hard. Uh, my my brother and sister in law do a wonderful job of instilling uh, leadership in their kids. They have several kids, um, and so they they instill this leadership in their older kids to uh, be leaders in the family and to you know teach the younger kids and to to have those skills. Um, I remember in my grade school days, we had chapel buddies, and I think a lot of Lutheran schools still do this. We had chapel families. And so there was a kid from every grade age um, in, in a chapel family. And so when you got to be an eighth grader, you were the leader of that chapel family and you got to, um, you know, be that that source of leadership for those younger kids. And that was a, a fantastic experience, both from when I was a little kindergartner and my oldest brother got to be my eighth grader because I cried so much. They let him be my eighth grader um, <laughs> introvert, like uh, <laughs> to, to being that eighth grader and, and knowing that you were, you know, quote unquote, in charge of of that group. That is a great source of leadership. And I know in vacation Bible school, as well. Um, there's so many opportunities. My home church now has great opportunities for um, for kids to be leaders in, in little safe spaces in, in order to, to hone those leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think like just remembering, like you said, that safe space of leadership, because I think a lot of times, especially with teenage youth, I see this, we mm -hmm. throw them into leadership situ situations, but don't either give them the skills, the feedback or the grace that they need in those leadership situations. Um, and that's where the guilt comes in. So we want to make sure where we're giving children opportunities for building leadership, giving youth opportunities for leadership, and frankly, even our adults, right, especially in our churches, that those are still wrapped with a whole whole lot of grace in them. Yeah. Yeah. So Andy, what are you thinking before our break? Any, any thoughts on that? What ways Sarah, have you seen children learn leadership skills? Sarah gave my example as well. I was going to say that the chapel <laughs> okay, Lutherans. Well. <laughs> just seeing that in school, seeing the opportunities for older students mm -hmm. to get to um, practice leadership with the younger students, whether it's as chapel buddies or reading stories, uh, reading a book, mm -hmm. um, spending time during reading time, reading books to younger children. Um, I, I've seen that in our Lutheran school. And I think that that's a, a great example of practicing leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. That's really good. Mm -hmm. And I know we have to go to break. I was thinking a little <laughs> bit of a small example of uh, just the other day, my youngest, who's nine, said to me, he like put his little hand on my arm and said, Mom, you know, I just don't know if I'm going to want to go to college. And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, really glad you feel like you could share that with me. I'm not sure we need to make that decision today. Like I, but I'm glad you're kind of thinking about those things. But, you know, that's a sample of like tiny leadership, right? That I have some agency in my own life and I can do good things in this world, even if that looks different than maybe some of my family values. I mean, because we, we're pretty big education people in our house, but we're also very clear with our kids that they, um, 
can do many, many different things in this world to contribute and that everyone in this world has a contribution, uh, no matter what that looks like. And so that's a small example of how children build leadership skills when you have had conversations that allow them space to be able to say what they think about uh, their future or about other people's future or about the future of our world, our community and our churches. So, all right, I'll stop talking. Andy, <laughs> is it break time? <laughs> it is. We'll, we'll be right back. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Concord Matters is the program where we seek to be of one mind that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, Christ-confessing Concordians read through and discuss the Book of Concord, which is our Lutheran confession of faith drawn from Holy Scripture, so that you too may be of one mind and confess with Christ. Be sure to listen every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio or anytime on KFUO.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. Until we convene for Concord again, keep confessing, church. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa, host of Thy Strong Word, taking your questions as we go through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter. Let's read together with guest pastors from around the country and the church around the world, taking chapters and verses together in context, every passage fitting together in the Lord Jesus, because He is the Word of God. Let's read together. Thy Strong Word, weekday mornings at 11 on Worldwide KFUO. Underwritten by Lutheran Heritage Foundation, lhfmissions.org. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday. We're talking with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman today. Today we're talking about initiative and the connection of uh, initiative to leadership as well. And before we went to break, we were talking about uh, children um, learning leadership in some settings, uh, particularly I think the examples we've been using is in the school setting, uh, older children having the opportunity to serve as leaders for younger children. But what about younger children? What opportunities mm -hmm. do they have to develop leadership or learn leadership skills? Yeah, you know, in the classroom setting, it's, I think, a little clearer for us uh, when we talk about it. It's the examples that come to our mind first. And I think of little simple things like being the line leader. I mean, these sound really silly, right? Or being the person who changes the calendar date. Um, <laughs> those kinds of things for us are like, okay, you know, ho-hum, yes, of course, we're going to do that. But this is like massive learning for small children. Um, and I think then uh, when we teach them uh forgiveness conversations, if you will. I think that a lot of times those are a place of leadership when we're teaching them how to communicate with each other when they're not getting along, when they're not uh, able to uh, resolve something together that they still can problem solve. That's where we're talking about um, the power of some some leadership skills too in a more organic way, if you will. And those happen best at home. Um, I like on my uh, Mental Health Monday YouTube channel, there's a video last week uh, or the week before last from Dr. Kim Markshausen. And one thing she pointed out was that things that are learned at home are tagged or within a family, I should say. It doesn't mean that's at home. I should I should correct that in a family are tagged by the brain as more important. So if you learn these skills within your family context, that's going to go a whole lot further than if you only learn them at school. We know that as a fact. Um, the other thing that also your brain tags as more important is when you learn it in more than one area of your life or more than one vocation of your life. 
And so that's why we also want the kids to learn it at school because it's going to give them more places. I would love it if we engaged as a church in also being a space in our faith communities, in our Sunday activities, our Wednesday activities, and our, you know, every other day of the week activities that we have with small children, uh, that that is also a place where we're concerned about development of kids and this concept of especially the way that shame and guilt and grace interact in their systems um, and just building building those little leaders, building contributors um, and uh, helping them know they have a purpose and a place in this world. That's really a huge piece of initiative. Um, and so if we can turn to the Bible for a second, I think uh, one of the verses that we utilize for uh, leadership and for uh, the future and tomorrow for uh, kids as they maybe graduate uh, preschool, kindergarten, uh, senior high school, or all those spaces, we like to use the verse Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a really good verse. It's it's a it's such a life giving verse. It speaks to many of us in different times of life, and we want them to kind of carry it with them, right? To latch on to it. However, just like so many things, we have forgotten the context of the verse. And I think it's really important for this concept of initiative that we pull it back to the context. So when you send a card and it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope, because that's what initiative is about, right? A future and a hope that I can move forward. I can do things. Uh, we have to remember the rest of the story. So I'm going to read Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14 to give you the whole picture. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So Jeremiah 29, 11 is a verse of struggle, right? So it's not a verse of like, we're doing everything well. We're so great at this. We're moving forward because we're full of big ideas and uh, complete capability. Instead, Jeremiah 29, 11 is a verse of we had to go to exile because we could not keep it together, <laughs> like because we couldn't lead, because we were not doing the thing that was good for us, that was asked of us. And so understanding that gives us a better lens for when we utilize this verse for building those little leaders. If we're going to throw it down on top of them all the time, then we also have to give them the grace and the space to make big mistakes, right? To be the people who need exile, who um, might need discipline and grounding. And I think that's an important piece of initiative uh, that, that we're not going to be perfect. It's just so important when we talk about leadership that there is a lot of grace built in. So it's not the successes of life that bring us purpose or a sense of purpose. I mean, those those are great and they feel really good. But guess what? Research shows us, too, that that's not where we find purpose. And we find other things there. We find some excitement, you know, but we don't find purpose there. The struggles of life and that resilience in that uh, connecting us to God and to one another, that's where we find some purpose. So where are we giving room to make mistakes with our family, with the kids in our lives, uh, with one another. And so, you know, in our last couple of minutes, Andy and Sarah, consider all the different skills in the world. What are some you, we think we want kids to say, hi, I can do that. So just name a skill that you think we want kids to do. <laughs> uh, standing up for the little guy. Oh, that's good. That's right. Voice one, for the voiceless. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. We're going to talk about that more next time too. So that's yes. really good. How about you, Andy? What do you think? Just simply reading in public, oh. uh, mm -hmm. reading oh. in, in front of others, not just in his own class, but in, uh, in, in mm -hmm. others, in public and places where he's not, where he doesn't know everybody. 
Yeah, that's good. And so capable Mm -hmm. of sharing out loud with some confidence, right? And with no shame, if you will. Um, And so you can see then how, well, especially reading in public, how are we going to make mistakes in that, right? What is that going to look like? as a small child, as a child in middle school, as a teenager, as a young adult, and as, um, you know, elderly senior, like, are we able, I, I think this really applies even, you can see to elderly seniors, what about when our sight is going and it's kind of hard to see the words that we need to put our glasses on? Mm-hmm. Or what about if uh, my memory is not 100%? Um, so we want to make sure our values revolve around that grace in leadership, not, around simply the desire for the skills in leadership. So we have to match those two things together to have the Christian lens of initiative. It will set us apart. It is a lot different, right? Um, I think the world says to children, do it, do it well the first time and don't mess up. I think that's a problem. And I, I hope that our spaces can be a little bit different, a little bit different. So, mm. you know, also then in choosing vocation, you know, are they allowed, just like my son with his like little college comment is, are they allowed to explore um, those things in different vocations, see which one fits? Um, what does that look like for small children? You know, we're going to dive into that a little bit more in the coming weeks, but where do, where do we let them explore that initiative and leadership as they grow up? Uh, and then even as adults, you know, each of us in our own place and space each day, you know, so I encourage you today for your mental health to go out and make some mistakes <laughs> in, your, <laughs> in your leadership, like, or identify, look at how you're making some mistakes in leadership, but like, let that grace rush in because because guess what? That is the thing that will help you go out and be a better leader tomorrow and have that voice for the voiceless to be able to have that confidence the next time you speak out loud. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Or send an email to gifts at kfuo.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.